And now, Environmental Impact, Net Positive with Tara Hammer and Paul Pullman. Good morning and welcome. I'm privileged to be having a conversation today with one of the leading voices in driving purpose in business, Paul Pullman. For those of you who don't know Paul, Paul was the CEO of Unilever from 2009 to 2019. And during that time, he transformed the company through Unilever's sustainable living plan and drove significant business results. When he exited Unilever, he wanted to continue that journey and he co-chairs and co-founded Imagine, an organization that brings together business leaders and CEOs to drive towards meeting or exceeding the UN's sustainable development goals. Welcome to the stage, Paul. Thank you, Tara. And first of all, best wishes for 2022. Indeed, indeed, we all need those best wishes. So I'd love to dive right into your book, Net Positive. And you, you speak to the fact that in order for companies to thrive now and in the future, really those companies need to reprioritize and need to reprioritize quickly. You know, fundamentally, uh, we have defined uh, net positive as a company profiting and thriving by solving the world's problems, not by causing them. We have a very simple question that we ask business, and that is, is the world better off because your business is in it or not? At a more detailed level, if you want to, for us, a net positive company is actually a company that's improving the well-being of everyone that they impact, be it employees, customers, suppliers, and communities. And many organizations, I believe, are at the beginning of that journey. And it involves uh, building partnerships. It involves setting targets that the world needs, not the targets that you can get away with. It involves working on the more transformational uh, changes that the world needs. And the reason we're advocating for this net positive thinking is very simple. I think what COVID has shown us very clearly is that you can't have healthy people on an unhealthy planet. It has also reminded us that we cannot have infinite growth on a finite planet and anything you can do infinitely is by definition unsustainable. So our argument is very simple. CSR or being less bad is simply still bad. It's not good enough anymore. Nor is being sustainable neither good nor bad. Uh, We are in a world that we've overshot many of the planetary boundaries and increasingly we need to start to think regenerative, restorative, reparative. And that is what we call net positive. The hallmarks of a net positive company are very simple. These are companies that, as I said, take ownership of all the impacts and consequences, intended or not, that they have by their presence here on Earth, if you want to. These are companies that operate for the long-term benefit of both business and society. They create a positive return, actually, for all of their stakeholders. Their shareholder value, which you've done so extremely well with waste management, is a result of what you do, not a myoptic goal in itself. And finally, these companies forge the broader partnerships that are needed to drive these bigger systems changes that society is looking for. But one of the things that that struck me about net positive and the concepts in there is we often hear about environmental issues, and there's a lot of discussion around uh, carbon and and carbon negative and carbon neutrality. But it often isn't connected in a holistic way to the social issues. And when you speak about net positive, it's really making the connection of all of the above. Yeah, I could not agree with you more, Tara. What um, COVID, again, I think has put a spotlight on or certainly put it under the microscope is that the people that uh, were already getting the wrong end of the stick in this world are also the people that paid disproportionately the price for uh, for COVID, you know. And companies that really understand that and take care of that are not only increasingly better valued by the financial community, but also more resilient. And, and frankly, these are the companies that have done better during COVID and I think are also a better place coming out of it simply because of the stronger relationships and the higher trust, which is so important nowadays. One of your big pivots after leaving Unilever was to work more directly with many of the companies that are 
really going to drive the change that's needed in the world? Well, I realized that, Tara, when I was CEO, that uh, there are many things a CEO can do, but there are also some things they can't do alone, and yet they're being held to a much higher level of um, responsibility or accountability, if you want to, than they actually can deliver on. No CEO can solve the issues of plastics in the oceans or deforestation or human rights in the world, if you want to, uh, by themselves. And uh, the reason I created Imagine as a social enterprise is to create a neutral platform where we bring a critical mass of CEOs uh, by industry sector together across the value chain. And what we see is that as we build trust with these CEOs, they collectively become more courageous. You can start to attack issues that CEOs normally don't get to. And by having about 20, 25% of a value chain present, we can attract civil society and governments and drive the broader systems changes. So we like to work at this collective level, uh, currently optimizing within a current system that frankly isn't designed anymore to deliver is very difficult. So we need these bolder changes now more than ever. Uh, these things are not easy to do, but increasingly, uh, contrary to people's beliefs when COVID came, when people thought we would go back to the same behavior as during the financial crisis, which was more cost cutting and short term and forgetting ESG and governments not interested in climate change. We've actually seen the opposite. Governments have stepped up. 90% of the GDP in governments have now made commitments to be net zero uh, by 2050, to stay below the one and a half degrees Celsius. We've seen half of the financial market come forward with the Glasgow Financial Alliance on net zero, $130 trillion of money under management, half the world's capital saying we want to decarbonize portfolios. And likewise, we've seen the private sector step up and set science-based targets and increasingly not only making 2050 targets, which is very far away, to be honest, but also setting increasingly the targets for 2030, like you've done yourself. Yeah, it really does feel like we're, we're at this tipping point. You know, in the past, we might have had, you know, business on board or NGOs on board, but we didn't have government or vice versa. It seems like we're finally at a point where many of these key stakeholders are aligning to drive real change. And, and you talk a lot about the power of partnerships and, and bringing those different stakeholders together. We simply cannot attack these bigger issues without the broader partnership, sometimes at industry level alone. Sometimes that needs to be done across industries. And sometimes these partnerships go even further to include civil society or, um, or governments. Uh, for example, right now, we are probably entering a decade where uh, multilateral institutions have uh, difficulties of working together, where global governance is at a low point, where increasingly in the countries itself, you see that tension, this populism or nationalism that has crept in, exactly because we haven't addressed these basic fundamental issues like climate change and inequality. And increasingly, we see that it's difficult for governments alone to solve these issues. And uh, the void that needs to be filled has to come from the private sector. Uh, business has the resources, the money, the people, uh, the innovative capabilities, a little bit uh, longer term perspective, believe it or not, quite often. And many people in society give business a higher level of trust, but also expect business to be part of these uh, broader changes that are now needed. But as I said, no company alone can do this. In Unilever, we made a commitment to move to sustainable sourcing for all of our ingredients. But some of them, we really were a small part of the global market. On others, like uh, making palm oil sustainable, it required governments from Indonesia and Malaysia to be there. To get deforestation out of your value chain, you certainly want the government of Brazil to work with you, not against you. So forming these broader coalitions is very important. And that um, is, is a... Uh, an area that requires uh, shared objectives to start with, a high level of trust if you want to, transparency in what you do, uh, aligned objectives between all of the partners, and then, you know, time-bound commitments that are transparently discussed and people held accountable for. And this is really what a net positive company does. It uses that multi-stakeholder model and these broader alliances in their ecosystem if you want to, um, to drive these bigger changes. Uh, goal 17 on the Sustainable Development Goals talks about partnership, and it defines it very well. 
not as this contractual partnership, but really this partnership for the common good, where you actually put the interest of others ahead of yourself, knowing that by doing so, you're better off yourself as well. This book, uh, Net Positive, talks about two forms of partnership that are important for us. The one chapter is what we call one plus one is 11, where really it's the partnership of responsibility in your own value chain beyond scope one and two. Many companies still stop there. They think you can outsource your value chain and also outsource your responsibilities. That just doesn't work anymore. The second chapter that we have in the book is really uh, what we call it takes three to tango that gets into the tougher partnerships where you need government and civil society to come together with business to solve these things. And here again, a great example from waste management is the advocacy you do to change the, the laws in the US around recycling and uh, what's possible there and to um, ensure that the right policies are in place to drive what we know is a very big challenge to change this uh, consumer behavior and, and, and get to the circular economy, for example. And that's why we have this uh, enormously uh, challenging but exciting chapter in the book, which we call the elephants in the room, which are really the tougher challenges on um, corruption, human rights, money in politics, um, CEO salaries, and, and there uh, to gain that trust that is needed for these broader partnerships what we are advocating is really that the companies also think about these tougher challenges and act consistently um, to be able to earn that right of the, of the seat at the table if you want to. One thing you mentioned earlier is measurement, and you have a great quote in your book, which I want to make sure I, I get right, related to measurement, and it's, we need to measure what we treasure. Um, I actually wrote it down and sitting on my desk now. Uh, we need to measure what we treasure. Talk a little bit more about that because it goes beyond, you know, the the typical measurements. If you think about GDP or even free cash flow, those types of things that companies are measured on a quarterly basis. What do you mean when you say we need to measure what we treasure? So you mentioned uh, GDP already, Tara, and that's important. Having a sense of total uh, economic activity is fine, but GDP was actually developed by Simon Koshnick in the 60s as a measure of economic output uh, in the era of manufacturing, if you want to, before the rise of this, uh, what we might call intangible value. Uh, uh, GDP counts everything as a good thing. You know, if you have more cancer or medical costs, if you have more wars or conflicts, if you have more damage that you need to repair because of giant storms or floods or fires, uh, that's if you cut down the trees and sell the wood, this is all economic activity that is measured in GDP. But what GDP doesn't measure is peace, is justice, uh, quality of education, absence of mental health issues, uh, air quality, and I could go on and on and on. So interestingly, everything that makes life worth living for is not necessarily captured in GDP. So we need to go to another broader measure. Interestingly, we did a study with the weighted impact accounts at Harvard, looking at 4,500 companies. And what we actually found was, to our surprise, that companies within a certain industry, compared to other companies within that industry, that those companies that actively attack these negative externalities actually are already higher valued by the financial market, which means that these non-material issues have become increasingly material. And we now see that companies that are more gender diverse have a better financial performance. Companies that aggressively um, attack climate change and publish that and, and make faster progress have a better financial performance in general and so forth. And you've seen that with uh, waste management once more. I looked at your share price over the last few years and because of your strategy of decoupling your growth from environmental impact on really moving to circular economy, on finding alternative upscaling possibilities for some of the things, uh, you've actually seen the rewards in your share price. And that was the same for Unilever. Despite our fairly aggressive Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, which was being seen by a lot of people as impossible to achieve. We actually went quite far into that direction, but at the same time over the 10 year period had a 
shareholder return. So it's this broader concept. And countries are already starting to think about this. We, we see um, uh, uh, other indicators emerging like a gen genuine progress indicator, the sustainable development goals, the human rights development index, uh, the gross uh, happiness index that has come out. And companies are starting to realize this as well. Their models increasingly move to decoupling production from resource use or carbon emission to embracing these circular economies or to finding regenerative solutions. So I think success is increasingly being defined broader than the financial returns. And the last point just to bring that home is that increasingly we're starting to see by looking, for example, at the Russell 1000 companies, that companies that run these longer term multi-stakeholder models, put sustainability at the core of their strategy, are also now starting to significantly outperform their peer groups that pay lip service to this. And this is why you see ESG funds taking off. That's why we've also seen 80% of the ESG funds, environmental, social and governance, outperform the non-ESG funds over 2021. So, you know, we're moving in the right direction and I'm actually not that worried in that sense anymore. The case is fairly convincing and most people are there. What I am now more focused on is that uh, everybody thinks they're moving. We are all doing significantly more than we've done before. But unfortunately, as we've waited so long to address these issues, the scale and speed that we're moving is simply not fast enough. And in some extent, the gap is actually increasing whilst we're doing more. So that is the issue in essence that we need to address. And that really boils down at the end of the day to leadership. Yeah, it, it's interesting. As you were talking, I was thinking about everything that's happening with the the great resignation, because in a lot of ways, the great resignation is about is about happiness and purpose and uh, our, our talent pool wanting to go to places that that fill them up in a different way and make sure that they're they're driving towards something that's bigger. And that's certainly something that when you think about young people in your in your book you talk about uh over 50% of millennials have said that they will leave or have left a company because it didn't align with their purpose and we have many uh young leaders and future leaders uh listening here today. So I'd love to hear from you uh, how you think that they can play in this net positive space and what is their role from an advocacy perspective in in ensuring that this the future will be theirs, ensuring that this future that we're all envisioning actually happens? No, this is a, such an important question and, and this great resignation last month alone in the UN, in the US, three and a half million people disengaged. And one of the bigger issues now that most of the CEOs that I talk to on a daily basis talk about is the attraction of talent. But then you have to bring that discussion straight back to purpose. This millennial or Gen Z generation wants to be a part of something bigger than themselves. They really want to ensure that they create a better world for all. That's why I also like your, your mission statements, which is um, really helping inhabitants of this earth, uh, the way you put it might be slightly different, different, but to make it better than they found it. And this is really a purpose that is extremely strong. You know, the young people below 30 years old is 50% um, of the world population, actually, and it's uh, over 100% tomorrow. And they're young, they're creative, they're technologically savvy, they embrace partnerships, they're purpose-driven, they think multi-generational. So they have all the elements, I think, to be successful. And I work a lot with young people in the different movements that we try to touch with Net Positive. And I can tell you the ideas that they're coming with and the entrepreneurial spirit that you have there is is uh, is incredible. Um, they see this, by the way, not as risk management or a big threat, but most of them see this as an enormous, enormous opportunity. But obviously, um, we're not embracing them at the rate that we should. I was at Glasgow for the 10 days and I would say the average age of the people in the conference itself might have been about 60 years old, but the average age outside making their voices heard was probably less than 30 years old. So this is the moment, I believe, that we should not only give the young uh, people and, and leaders a seat at the table, but in many cases, we should actually give them the table. 
and they're demanding for it. 86% of the millennials or Gen Cs are now expecting CEOs to be the societal leaders. In fact, 50%, as you say, have made choices not to work for organizations. They are simply not moving fast enough. We're seeing bycots or we're seeing walkouts when they are dissatisfied with what management says and what management does. I believe in every company now where you have a lot of young people. Most companies are actually, the majority of people are already baby boomers and to some extent Gen Cs. But um, uh, they're making, making very clear in these companies that uh, management should close the say-do gap that still is uh, too prevalent in, in too many companies if you want to. So what can they do specifically? I think what um, they should do, first of all, uh, uh, encourage the leaders of today uh, not to keep um, asking the question why, which is still happening too much, but start demanding when. We have endless debates still if we should act and, and how much we should do and if others are not responsible. But I think the young people have a little bit of a higher level of impatience. So they don't want to be paralyzed by these discussions. They really want to have the real targets, uh, the real deadlines that the world can, can uh, support, not that you can get away with. So the second thing that young people can do, be um, constructively skeptical, I would say. You know, in every optimist, which we all should be to some extent in terms of being able to tackle um, this, uh, these challenges, we should also ask the right questions. When we see... Uh, companies not moving fast enough on on uh, racial diversity, we should call that out. When we see them making statements on environmental targets, but then paying lip service when it comes to actual delivery, we should call it out. Just like we should call out politicians when they say we will build back better, but then spend their money on other areas. And the final thing that young people can do, the third area I would say is be part of this net positive movement. This is probably the biggest economic, social, and planetary opportunity that we have in our lifetimes. And I don't think your bosses that might move a little bit slower than what you are looking for are not necessarily bad people, but they are also not really aware sometimes of what is going on. Educate them, show them that things can be done better from all aspects for all stakeholders, but also that it actually improves the resilience and the profitability of an organization. So become part of that change movement constructively and bring in the new technologies, the knowledge, the benchmarking that you need uh, to to make your companies that you work in successful. I love that. Really help show how, how you can do it better, how you can do it faster, because that's ultimately what we need if we're going to move very quickly on this journey to be net positive. Well, Paul, I, I cannot thank you enough. This has been a fantastic conversation. I feel like we could have talked for another hour and, and still not tackled or scratched the surface on all the things that we wanted to talk about here today. And looking forward to continuing on the journey of, of Net Positive here at WM and helping support other companies in their journey. No, thank you for what you're doing and uh, and certainly for the audience for uh, taking the time out to listen to this conversation. As you said, uh, it's uh, it's important for all of us, but it's also something that we are passionate about and I know the audience is. And I certainly hope uh, to see you soon in person, but in the meantime, be safe. Thank you very much. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, Circularity, partnering in Circularity.